Hello, and welcome to the How To series on COVID recovery presented by the Manningham Business Network. Now, this series of webinars that the network is putting together is only possible because of the assistance we've received from the state government of Victoria. And we're very grateful for their assistance in getting this project up and running successfully. Now, the Manningham Business Network is presenting this series of webinars to help businesses recover and continue to grow in 2021 with the purpose of engaging, reinvigorating and collaborating within Manningham businesses locally. Now, the focus of the series is to enable business owners and managers to have the tools they need to get back into business successfully, remain safe and continue to operate in a manner that's compliant with any COVID restrictions in force at the time. Now, today's webinar, we're very fortunate to have with us today two people from the LDB Group, one of Melbourne's most highly regarded accounting and advisory practices. And they are also silver sponsors of our Manningham Business Network. So we're very grateful to them for that. Daniel Dubois is the accounting and advisory principal and Adam Betts, the accounting and advisory senior manager. And they're going to talk to us today about end of financial year tax planning, which is important every year when this time of year comes around. But because of the time of this recording, they're also going to be covering some special information from the Victorian government's uh, grants available uh, to support uh, uh, businesses who've been affected during the recent circuit breaker lockdown that we've been through. I encourage you to have pen and paper beside you to take notes because during the recording of the webinar, we're not going to be taking questions live. There will be a screen that uh, Daniel and Adam will share with you at the end with their contact details and they're more than happy for you to reach out to them after this webinar with any questions or concerns you might have. Now, a special treat for those that are attending live and not watching the recording of this on the Manningham Business website later on. Uh, after we stop recording, both Daniel and Adam have said they can stay around for perhaps another 10 or 15 minutes to answer your questions. So there will be that opportunity after the recording stops. So it's with great pleasure. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Daniel and Adam. Thank you so much for your generosity and sharing your wisdom and insights and information with us today. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks also, of course, to Manningham Business Network for uh, hosting the webinar and giving us the opportunity to try, on, try and pass on uh, um, some of the things we've learned across the years that um, allow businesses, individuals and uh, everyone really get ready for tax planning. We're going to try and cover off on um, general tax planning uh, tips and ideas, um, including both superannuation, businesses, individuals, all of those sorts of different aspects of what we're trying to achieve. We'll also cover off on the changes that were introduced in the federal and state budgets this year, and they're fairly recent to now. So that's um, some, some changes that are not huge this year, but certainly um, likely to have an impact that might affect some of the decisions that you make leading up to 30 June. Um, and then Adam will also finish off on um, the very recent announcement of the Circuit Breaker grants. And there's two different grants to cover off on there. They're unfortunately fairly limited, but certainly if your business is in the right industry, um, it's certainly worthwhile applying. Um, so we'll just sort of kick into gear straight away if we can. Obviously, we need to indicate that this is just general commentary only that we're providing today. Um, it's not specific advice. If you do need to get specific advice, um, we would first of all urge you to get in touch with your accountant. If you have a, an accountant at the moment, um, if you do need assistance with us, please get in touch. Um, our details will be provided at the end, as Sandy advised, um, and there'll also be a chance to um, you know, have a bit of a chat with us at the end. But even then, that's still not going to be specific advice in relation to your circumstances, and we would urge you to get the proper advice if you need it. I'm starting off the presentation today with superannuation, which is probably a little bit of a different approach from prior years where we would have focused on businesses and individuals and things like that. And the reason for that is I'm really wanting to emphasise that superannuation is becoming a far more important and critical part of everybody's wealth planning, tax planning, um, and really just your overall financial health is going to be governed more and more in the future by what you're doing with superannuation, um, particularly in light of the fact that, you know, 
Contributions to a super fund are only taxed at 15% compared to the individual tax rates. Now, you know, your personal marginal tax rates for most people are going to be at the minimum 30%, likely to be 42%, and might be as high as the top marginal rate, which, you know, once you include Medicare levy, levy, levy is 47%. So superannuation um, makes a big tax difference. And we'll only be advising today in relation to the tax consequences of it. Um, if you do need to get uh, financial advice, you'll need to speak to a financial advisor as opposed to an accountant. We're only allowed to really speak to you about the tax side of things. But for the 2021 year, the concessional cap, which means the amount that you can have go into, into a superannuation fund where a tax deduction is obtained, now that could either be by the employer or by you individually, that's limited to $25,000 and increases to $27,500 for the next financial year. But it's, um, it's a really um, important way for people to be able to build their future nest eggs. It's a very tax effective way of doing it. Um, you know, that, that marginal tax rate difference between superannuation and individuals is, is quite significant. A couple of years ago, it was opened up such that even if you um, are employed and your employer is contributing on your behalf, nowadays you can still make your own contributions on top of that and receive a personal tax deduction. And that wasn't possible in the past. But it is important to note that, that con those contributions must be received by the fund by 30th of June in order to receive the deduction. So you need to get the paperwork back from the fund saying that they have received your contribution to make sure you get that deduction. Also, just covering off on Division 293 tax, um, which is reasonably understood, but still not something that's fantastically understood out there in terms of whilst it's the superannuation fund may only be taxed at 15%, once you go past $250,000 of combined taxable income plus your superannuation contributions, there will be an extra 15% tax on top of that. It's still going to be tax effective though to contribute to superannuation funds because if you're on more than $250,000 as that combined income and taxable contributions, your marginal tax rate is 47%. That compares to a net rate of 30% on your tax is still 17% in front. So it's still very worthwhile to try and um, get as much as you can into superannuation. Um, in relation to superannuation um, and the ability to contribute as you get older, um, there's no work test under the age of 67. However, once you're older than that, you must be working at least 40 hours over a 30-day period in order to be making these concessional contributions. So, and from the 1st of July 2019, um, you can still make contributions in, for one more year after the, you um, stop working. So it, as long as your super balance is less than $300,000. Now, something that's also relatively new is the carry forward provisions. And these are not um, very well publicised or understood, but that $25,000 concessional contribution cap, um, as long as your super balance is less than half a million dollars from 1 July 18, you can effectively look back all the way to the 18 and um, um, sorry, the 2019 and forward years. And if you contributed less than $25,000, you can effectively do a catch up contribution, still obtain the tax deduction in, in the current year, in, if that's FY21, or you can plan for doing it in future years. Where we're seeing that particularly useful is if you have a single year where you get high income by virtue of trading or bonuses or in particular capital gains if you sell an investment property or the like we're seeing that the, that ability to use those carry forward provisions can make a big reduction for people's um, taxable income by putting additional funds into superannuation um, just touching also on the non-concessional contributions cap so um, and the 1.6 million dollar pension cap so those non-concessional contributions allow you to put um, super, you can make superannuation contributions where you don't receive a tax deduction for doing it. And the reason for doing that is that once those funds are in the superannuation sphere, 
Um, there are only, any earnings on those are only going to be taxed at 15%. So it's, it's quite worthwhile if you've got funds outside of superannuation, um, you're allowed to put up to $300,000 over any rolling three-year period into superannuation on that basis. And um, it, it can make a big difference over the longer term. Now, that cap, I think, moves to $1.7 million for the FY, I think they should read FY22 year, actually. Um, so uh, they are going to continue to evolve as time goes on. So that, that so that's referring there to the $1.6 million pension cap. And that's referring to the total amount of funds that you can have within superannuation where they will be concessionally taxed. Now, just touching on a few other issues, and if, you, if any of these do um, provide you or if any of these are of interest to you, I suggest you either do a bit more reading or come and get some advice. But there's the ability to do um, contribution splitting with your spouse. Um, if you sell your home and you're of an age where it's appropriate to do so, you can contribute additional funds into superannuation dollars in, in, into superannuation up to $300,000 per person. Um, that does not is not governed by the non-concessional contribution caps or anything like that. Um, you don't even need to actually be um, buying a smaller home, even though it's called the downsizing provision. So that's something that we're seeing um, very gradually being taken up, but we expect to see more of it, particularly in this um, very robust real estate market that we're seeing at the moment. Um, there's the ability to make contributions on behalf of your spouse, depending upon their earnings as well. Um, and there's also the first home buyer contributions provisions as well. Um, also, just worth mentioning as well for all of the employers out there, um, I'm, I'm, it's, we're seeing a bit of it in the press, but um, it's certainly worth noting that from 1 July, um, the superannuation contributions rate or the SGC rate lifts from 9.5 to 10%. So just be mindful of that. Know that it's something that you're going to need to deal with in terms of understanding what the total amount of cost associated with employment is for you with your employees. All right. So moving more into the employer's sphere, so for business owners, probably one of the major things that we're seeing um, taken up as long as businesses are strong enough to be able to do so is the instant asset write-off. And this has been in place for the last couple of years, but along came COVID and um, in order to try and stimulate the economy, it's been made much more generous um, and applies to larger businesses. So um, I haven't bothered with this, the, the size of the businesses here because I think everybody attending today is likely to be a small to medium-sized business owner. Um, once, you, once you start getting above $50 million, there's a few limitations of $50 million of turnover. There's a few limitations, but I don't think they apply here. Um, it used to be that you could only buy assets up to $30,000. You can now buy assets up to $150,000. And this instant asset write-off enables you to get a 100% tax deduction in the year of purchase. Keeping in mind that in order to receive that deduction, you need to have paid for and the piece of equipment that you've bought or the asset that you've acquired does need to effectively be installed. So, um, this can be effectively used for car purchases. We're seeing it being used commonly, um, computers, equipment. Um, probably given how late we are in June now, you might find it a stretch to get significant pieces of equipment installed by 30th of June, but um, it's still certainly worth considering um, and it does apply to new and secondhand assets. Um, moving on to more sorts of general issues that we talk about with our clients each year. Um, making sure your suppliers have invoiced you by the 30th of June if you can. Um, for corporate entities, um, even if you haven't paid the invoice, you'll be entitled to a deduction when the goods and services have been supplied. So where, um, where you've received services in relation to either um, or so from other service industries, um, for, the, um, for the supply of goods, for whatever it is that, you're, that you would call your business inputs, Make sure you've been invoiced. Um, follow up with your suppliers. You'll get a tax deduction for it, even if you haven't paid for it. Um, also, if you're a business that um, produces um, stock, or sorry, if you hold stock or if you produce stock, um, make sure you take a look at your stock valuations. Make sure that you're not holding on to things that are worthless, that, you, that have been sitting there in your stock list for the last three or four years and you, and you are not going to have a prospect to sell them. So make sure you take a look at those and write them down. 
Um, also worth looking at your work in progress as well if you um, produce that sort of asset in your, in your accounts. Um, also take a look at your depreciation schedule. Look at your fixed assets. If you've got some, if you've got a fax machine that's been sitting on your uh, depreciation schedule for 10 years and of course it's been thrown away long ago, it shouldn't be sitting there in your depreciation schedule. Make sure you go through things, write them off, scrap them, um, tidy up that depreciation schedule. And it's, it's surprising to me every year that clients need to be brought back to that to try and make sure that they get that done. In terms of prepayments, um, you're able, to, uh, individuals and small business entities are able to claim prepayments as a tax deduction up to 12 months in the year of actual payment. Larger businesses need to apportion it on the basis of the time of use, but smaller businesses that use the small um, business provisions are actually able to, uh, to claim that straight away up front. Um, on the bad debt side of things, review your trade debtors. So if you've got clients sitting in the 90 plus days where you do not think that you're going to have a chance of recovery, um, you've made all reasonable efforts to recover them um, and that you can document that. So it's not only important to say, oh, yes, I've done everything that I can recover them, but you definitely need to be able to support it. And the way that the rules in relation to bad debt write-offs are drafted, something that's a small asset or something that's a small debt, um, fairly easy to write it off and just say, look, I've sent through statements, I've sent through invoices and they've ignored me and you can write it off and you'll get a tax deduction for that write-off. But for larger amounts that are outstanding, you need to demonstrate that you've gone through a steadily more rigorous process in terms of trying to recover them, whether you've used one of the recovery, uh, debt recovery businesses, whether you've used solicitors, how you've gone about approaching the process of recovering those, um, those debts um, allows you to claim them as bad debts later on. So as I said, make sure you document that process. Um, moving now more to employees and individuals, so it's more of the sole traders style of taxpayer, um, it's important to note that you are assessed on a cash basis. So when you receive the income is when you're going to be taxed on it. So for invoices that you've issued in June, and if you want it to be included in the 2020 year, follow, follow them up. If your income's on the low side and you know that you're going to recover next year, and you think that that's going to boost you up into a higher tax bracket, it may be worth trying to call up some of your debtors and asking them to see if they can please pay you before 30th of June. Obviously, it's a reliant upon the relationships that you have with your, with your customers. But, you know, it's, it's, it's another part of understanding the implications of the timing of income upon your eventual tax position. Um, in relation to motor vehicle deductions, um, make sure you... Uh, know where you sit in relation to the two different ways of claiming motor vehicle deduc deductions. And that's using the cents per, cents per kilometre method, where you travel below 5,000 kilometres and it's a fixed rate per kilometre. And then for everything above 5,000 kilometres, it's worth considering whether or not you're going to use the logbook method. And with the logbook method, you've got a lot more work to do. You've got to have a full listing and be able to support all of the costs. And you also need to have a, a logbook prepared once every five years that gives you a representative sample of the extent of business compared to private travel that you undertake in your car. So you need to choose a 12-week period and every single trip needs to be documented. So what that does is it establishes a business proportion, which might be anywhere from, you know, 50% to 95%. Um, and then that's got to be, you then use that to um, support claiming that percentage of all of the costs that you, um, that you have recorded. Okay. But if you have, if you're only probably claiming 6,000 kilometres, you, you may, and your business percentage is low, you may find that the cents per kilometre method is more generous and you can still use it. Um, so home office has certainly been um, a fun time for all, all of us. Um, everyone's working from home. And um, previously there was a what we call a safe harbour provision which allowed for 52 cents per hour worked in the home. Um, for many people now, we've all been working from home and we're back there again at the moment. Um, and that enables you to claim for the 20, 2021 year, 80 cents per hour. So that's 
um, then frees you up from doing all of the work, which you can still do if you want to, but you can go by the actual cost method, which requires you to determine the proportion of the space in your home that is used in a dedicated way for a home office and it needs to be a separate room. And you then um, take that as a proportion of the total floor space of your whole home and then you collate all of the home office expenses, which does not include um, interest on your mortgage or any of those sorts of um, costs, but it does include all your utilities. Um, so you can then claim an actual uh, percentage of those if you so choose. Okay, so moving more into the planning sphere, dividends is a fairly significant area because one of the things for, so dividends are a way of um, getting profits out of a company to the shareholders that own a company. Now, your ownership structure is going to determine how that actually flows if it's owned directly by the individuals, which is the simplest way of owning a company, or if you have a discretionary or family trust that owns the company or any number of more complicated and complex structures. Um, but it does determine how the profits are going to flow out of the company. Um, you need to be aware of the marginal tax rates and the eventual tax position of those stakeholders. Um, you also need to be very aware, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail further on, but you need to be aware of the extent to which um, stakeholders in the business have actually taken money out of the company during the year and now have a loan payable to the company. And that creates what we call a Division 7A loan. And they need to effectively be extinguished and dividends are the most common way that we see where those are um, paid out of the company to the taxpayers and um, it, those loans are then you know, effectively removed out of the balance sheet. Um, it's also a time to consider whether or not a corporate beneficiary would be of use to um, the structure. That's more for if you have um, a business um, in a trust um, and then a business owned by a trust and then you want to actually take the profits out of the company through the trust and then have them eventually end up in a company because you don't need them personally right now. And if you have that option available to you, it can limit the tax payable to 30%, which is obviously dramatically down from the 47% top marginal rate. So that's another, probably a more complicated area to get into. Um, and certainly talk to your accountant if you do want to go down that sort of path. Now, interestingly, over the last couple of years, the company tax rate, which used to be 30%, has been on a gentle drift downwards per year. And um, for the 2021 year, it's 26%. And for the 2022 year onwards, it's going to be 25%. Now, one of the more interesting things to consider out of that is that when you pay a dividend, it brings along franking credits. And whilst you may have been paying in the past your company taxes at a rate of 30%, um, the way that the, these company tax rate changes have been implemented, you are only able to attach franking credits in any given year of dividend um, using the, the company tax rate for that year. So whilst you may have paid tax at 30 cents in the dollar, um, you were you only going to be able to get 26% as a franking credit attached to any dividends for this year and 25% from then onwards. So there are, um, I know it's only relatively small differences, but it does depend upon the size of the dividends that are going to be paid in terms of um, planning for getting those franking credits out of the company and into the hands of the eventual taxpayers that benefit from those dividends. So it might be more beneficial to pay dividends in the FY21 year in order to get those um, franking credits into the hands of the shareholders. Okay, so just returning again to Division 7A loans, um, we've provided a bit more of a definition here because it does expand just, it does expand beyond the company shareholders or, or associates. So you can't have your companies loan money to your family. You, um, and, and or friends and things like that. Where, where someone is actually an associate, they are um, deemed to be, um, any loan to them is deemed to be what's called a Division 7A loan. And um, these Division 7A loans, if they're not treated very carefully, 
effectively result in a dividend from the company to the individual um, and they're not franked and franking credits are stripped away from the company. So it's quite a it's very onerous and punitive, I suppose, are the words that I put in there because it's not a situation that anyone really wants to deal with. Where it's necessary and appropriate, um, a formal loan needs to be set up and that's the Division 7A loan. And that allows for repayments of that loan across seven years. Now, where it's possible, those dividends are, you know, those repayments are usually um, made by way of dividends to the company stakeholders. Um, and those interests, those, those loans also carry interest that's charged to the shareholder and deemed as accessible by the company. So it really is a, a, an awkward situation. So if you've got receivable loans in, the, in, in, your, in your company structures, um, you really do need to make sure you take a look at that sooner rather than later. Um, now, trusts, a slightly different story to companies. Um, there's a few compliance things that do need to be taken care of here. Um, leading up to the 30th of June for each financial year, even though the year is not over, by 30th of June each financial year, trusts need to have generated what's called a trustee resolution. And with that, the resolution um, is just a document. Uh, it's a legal document and it actually details who is going to be receiving the benefit of income from the trust for that financial year. Now, depending upon the, the provisions of your trust deed, you can be doing different things with capital gains and franked income or trading income or whatever it might be. But you do need to make sure that you're in accordance with the, with the trust deed, which is basically the, the birth, birthing document for a trust um, and details what rules it has to follow. They need to be prepared and signed prior to 30th of June each year. So ideally, that's something that is um, sent out to you by your accountant, um, usually after having a bit of a chat with you about what the year's trading has been like. Um, we, we do it as part of our tax planning each year. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly going to emphasise this as well. This, this requirement has been around for quite a long time, but it's an area um, that is coming under more and more scrutiny by the ATO. So if you end up with a situation where you're being put through an ATO audit, you need to make sure you've got these trustee resolutions in place and you can demonstrate that they were considered, at the very least, they were received and considered um, and preferably signed by 30 June each year. They need to be signed. Sometimes the signing is hard to prove, but at the very least, if you've got um, something in place with a date stamp being an email that shows that you've received them and, signed and, and considered them, um, you should be in the clear. Also each year, um, we need to make sure if you've got new beneficiaries to any trust, um, you, there's a form that gets lodged with the ATO detailing those new beneficiaries for a trust. Um, and just touching again here on corporate beneficiaries, so where you've got a trust, whether it's a trading trust or an investment trust, where you want to try and limit total tax payable to 30%, you can set yourself up a corporate beneficiary. Now, just going back a step to where we talked about those company tax rates, those company tax rates, which are dropping to 25%, that only applies to trading entities. Your corporate beneficiaries, if they're receiving the benefit of trading income or investment income from another, from a trust or from another source or, or from passive income within themselves, um, they, their tax rate is, only, is still going to be 30%. So that's something to, to be aware of about the difference in tax rates between corporate beneficiaries and uh, trading entities, trading companies. So, uh, and also just the last point there is just making sure that if you've got any Division 7A loans where a corporate beneficiary um, is entitled to income, that that income gets paid through into the trust. So if you're gonna set up a corporate beneficiary and distribute income to them, you need to make sure that you're actually receiving that income. So it's another part of tax planning that comes into play for our more complex entities. So that, that covers off on my half of the presentation. Um, I'll hand over now to Adam, who's gonna go through the budgets and the uh, grants. Thanks, Daniel, and thanks, Sandy, as well. Um, look, I won't cover off too much of the budget details in, in great detail, just um, 
I guess, time permitting. And also Daniel's actually covered off um, most of these changes that um, in his earlier slides when he was talking about business and employee superannuation rules. So I'll go through these um, budget updates just briefly here. So probably the main thing that comes out of the budget um, announced in May, in May was probably the personal income tax side of things. So they've announced that the, the lower middle income tax offset uh, will be extended through to 30 June 2022. It was due to end 30 June 2021, but that's been extended now another 12 months. Now, probably the, the one thing just to clarify with how that works is, I guess often I get clients asking me, oh, so I'm going to get $1,080 refund in my tax return. Just to clear that up a little bit, what it is, what this thousand dollars is, it's firstly it's a sliding scale offset, which will there's a sweet there's a sweet spot in terms of um, maximising that thousand dollars and eighty thousand and eighty dollars to get back in your return, and that goes up to ninety thousand dollars taxable income. So it does it's a sliding scale as your income increases. Um, so we'll start low and eventually get up to thousand eighty dollars. But the second point, just to clarify, is that it is a form of a tax offset and what the ATO call a refundable tax offset. So what that means is when we do your tax return, we work out your income, less or your deductions gets to a taxable income amount. We then work out your raw tax or your, your gross tax amount that's um, payable on the taxable income. What comes off your taxable income are things like if you're employed, your pay-as-you-go withholding comes off as a offset to reduce your tax, your raw tax liability down a little bit. Um, now, if you get to a point where that your, your pay-as-you-go withholding tax with help by your employer um, exceeds your tax payable, then you get a refund here. This offset works very similar to that. So if your tax payable is a certain amount and this $1,000 reduces it to zero and then goes into credit, you're, you're able to get a refund of the balance of this offset kind of um, moves your tax payable down into a credit. Whereas some other offsets, what the, what the other offsets do is they reduce your income tax down to zero, but you're not able to get the refund for the balance of what the offset reduces your income to your income tax to. So just to clarify that a little bit there for you. On the next slide, I'll run through really briefly with the, the changes to the tax rates for the 30 June 2021 tax year. And there's some other changes which we won't go through today, but there's some other changes forecasted in the in the um, in the ATO's tax um, reduction scheme, along with the companies as well. So I'll go through that briefly in a moment. Um, on the superannuation side of things, well, Daniel's covered most of these off in the earlier slides, but just the, a couple of key points was the the concessional contribution cap will be increasing from twenty five thousand dollars to twenty seven and a half thousand dollars from one July twenty twenty one. So that cap where you can contribute tax deductible contributions will increase to twenty seven and a half thousand dollars from one July, so in a month time. Just to clarify this next point, the the work test on the work test side of things, um, will will um, update the, the slides and send these through to you. Uh, as, as the email comes out from Sandy later on this afternoon. But just to clarify, the, the details here about the work test are the current rules. But from 1 July 2022, the government's proposing to effectively scrap the work test um, for, for people between the ages of 67 and 74. If you want to um, make non-concessional contributions or if you're doing salary sacrifice contributions through your employer, um, so we'll, we'll detail some of those changes in a bit more detail in, in the email that goes out this afternoon or this week. Um, but just to clarify, these are the current rules here, but there are some changes forecasted for 1 July 2022, assuming they do go through in a year's time. Um, the downsize of contribution that Daniel touched on earlier, um, the age the, the age eligibility will be decreasing from 65 to 60 from 1 July 2022. Um, the other important point that Daniel mentioned earlier as well was the super guarantee. So there's the nine and a half super that you pay for your employees is increasing to 10% from 1 July 2021. So if you're using a software like Xero or MIV or, or a payroll specific software, these softwares will be all across those changes. So please speak to your accountant regarding the impacts on your business there. And the other thing about... Um, I guess low income earners up until now, <clears throat> there's been a threshold of $450 per month in terms of a wage payment 
where employers don't have to pay um, super guarantee on. But from 1 July 2022, it's been proposed by the government that um, that $450 minimum wage amount where super is ordinarily not payable on, so that so if you, have a, if you have a casual employee, as an example, that works less than receives less than $450 for a month, you don't have to pay super on that. But from 1 July 2022, you're going to have to start paying super on that $450 amount. So that's impacting employers there um, and, and individuals too. Um, there's just a quick snapshot on the, the tax rates. So I've just got there the tax rates for the current year for 30 June 2021 in comparison to last year. Um, so probably the, the biggest change there is the, the 19 cent cents rate um, tax rate where the brackets now increase from 37,000 up to 45,000. And the other important note is the 32 and a half um, percent bracket that um, upper limit's gone from ninety thousand up to one hundred twenty thousand dollars. So there's some, uh, and these are affected back um, when the government announced their October budget. There, so so that's good. So there's some um, there's some tax savings there for individuals going forward, and this will only get better in the next couple of years as well. Um, so these will be on the slides that we send through to you later on. From from a business point of view, um, probably just emphasising some of the changes that the government announced in October 2020 for their budget. So the first one was about the temporary full expen expensing or the instant asset write-off that Daniel mentioned earlier. That has been extended for another 12 months to 30 June 2023. And then the other thing that will be extended for another 12 months is what they call the loss carry back measures. Now, now what Put simply, what the loss carry back measures are is that the government's recognised that businesses have had a couple, potentially a couple of strong years back in the year end of 30 June 2019 and 30 June 2020, but in the current year and potentially going forwards due to the impacts of COVID, they're recognising and appreciating that businesses may not be doing as well as what they have been. And then as a result, rather than making a profit in their business, they might make a loss in their business through their trading. What these rules allow is that if you incur a loss, say this year for the 30 June 2021 year, you're able to actually go back and carry that loss back to the prior years, again, in the form of a, of a tax offset, I guess, in a way in your company tax return to help reduce prior year profits. Now, Probably the, the one thing to um, to note there is it's really important here to talk to your accountant or your, your advisor about the impacts there because there is an impact if you do own a company or own a business through a company, you've got what's called a Franken account, which is an accumulation of prior years tax paid, which then impacts the dividends that Daniel touched on about um, Franken credits that get passed out when you declare or pay a dividend to the shareholders. This loss carry back rule and the way it works is it effectively eats into your franking account and the available franking account credits that you've accumulated over the last few years to basically make um, a, a tax refund get created through the, the implementation of this scheme. So just important to understand what you're getting yourself into when you're applying these loss carry back measures. But for some struggling businesses, this could be quite a good thing in terms of a short-term cash injection um, through the, the negative impacts of COVID. So speak to your advisors on this as well. Um, just a snapshot on where the government's at with their um, plan to reduce company tax rates um, and probably mainly looking at the, the small business entities that Daniel was talking about earlier. So for the current year, the, the tax rate's coming down from 27.5% down to 26%. And then next year and future years, that rate will come down again from 26% to 25%. So for small businesses, um, over the last um, three or four years now, the tax rate's come down from 30% all the way down to 25%, So, which is good for small business. Um, in terms of the state budget, so look, there are a couple of um, announcements that look, I, I won't go through this in detail because it may not affect um, many people attending today, but it's important to note. To know. So from a payroll tax point of view, the payroll tax threshold will be increased now through the $700,000. So that's the, that's the wage and super and other employee benefit level before you have to register and pay payroll tax. So that is increasing. And there's a couple of new 
credit, I guess, that the, the, the Victorian government and the SRO are allowing for incentivising businesses to take on new employees, to take on new staff, both regional and also in the metro area. So they're providing uh, like what's called a new jobs tax credit, which works out to be, I think, it's 10%, oh, sorry, 10%, 10 cents per dollar of a um, additional wages spent compared to to your um to I think it's the prior year um payroll payroll paid so that that could be beneficial there if you've shown that you've taken on new staff um during the current year and there's also um an incentive there for regional employers as well just from um, reducing the payroll tax rate there as well um land tax as well they're they're increasing the threshold for the imposition of land tax from 250,000 up to 300,000 as well so that's another thing there for people who hold investment properties and the like um and then from a stamp duty point of view there's been some changes made to some of the stamp duty um rates and threshold as well um probably probably the key thing i guess and this is probably the most time critical um item on our agenda today when it comes to um, for, for businesses impacted by the, the, the recent Victorian lockdown is the circuit breaker grants. Um, the important thing to know here is these applications do close midnight next Thursday on the 24th of June. So if you haven't submitted your application for the grant, it's important to get that in as soon as you can. Don't leave it to the last minute. I'll explain why in a moment. There's just some practical things to think about and consider when you when you are putting your application. So rather than leave it to the last minute and having a mad rush to run around and submit the application, good to get on top of this earlier rather than later and speak to your accountant should you need some guidance to get through the application. It's not overly difficult, but there could be some curveball questions just to, I guess, to satisfy yourself that you're putting in the right declaration. The, 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 the declaration itself is on the business owner to agree to terms to the grant application and eligibility requirements. So it's important to be cover, covering these off. So, so the first option for grants is what they call the Business Cost Assistance Program. So what this is covering off is just basically general businesses, general businesses who are not a licensed hospitality venue. So, so this could include gardeners, um, it could include hairdressers, um, basically any other any businesses who are severely impacted by the recent lockdown. There's two amounts that are, that are available, and these amounts are automatically calculated based on the industry that you're in. So every business, every ABN has an attached ANZIC industry code to their ABN, which defines what business industry they are in. These amounts of grant um, uh, grant amounts that you are eligible for are then governed by your industry code. And if your industry code is an eligible industry to apply for the grant, based on the Victorian government's viewpoint on how um, your business could operate through the two weeks of lockdown will determine whether you receive $2,500. So $2,500 will be automatically calculated by the government if you were locked down and had restricted or no trading for one week or if your business um, the, and your business code was eligible for two weeks of closure, well, then you'll get the $5,000 amount received. So this is automatically calculated by the government based on what you put on the form and based on their checks back to your industry code. So in a nutshell, the grants can be used for different things like meeting business costs and covering utilities, wages and rent seeking financial advice just to help with continuing your business and planning to keep your business going, um, developing marketing and communication activities throughout your lockdown and when you're kind of changing and pivoting your business throughout um, the lockdown to be, I guess, more on, with, more, with a more online presence, as an example, and then other supporting activities relating to the operation of your business. Now, we'll send through as well as part of the email pack later this week um, the, the link to the government website, we can then choose which grant applies best for you. We'll send these details through to you, including a list of the eligible business codes as well. So we'll send that through to you as well. I guess just on that eligible business codes, there is a, a website, the abr.gov.au website, that you're able to log in as a business owner to check your ANSIC code. So when you do log into that, in the back end of your login to the business register um, website, 
you can go in and check your business code to make sure it marries up to the list that we will send you later this week, which will be the list of the eligible business codes that who can apply for these grants. So we'll send that through later this week. Um, just some of the basic eligibility to touch on. You always have to be based in Victoria, um, operating in a sector which um, is part of the, I guess, the eligible ANSI codes I mentioned before. So non-essential retail, hospitality, tourism, just to name a few. You need to have incurred indirect costs because of the restriction and you can't operate fully remotely. So, so just to clarify that, there's some... There's some fine print, as always, with these grants. There's some fine print embedded in the grant guidelines, which we'll send through to you later. But in terms of that definition of incurred direct costs, examples could be booking cancellations. So you might have bookings as a gardener for the first week, as an example, where you had bookings lined up, but they fell through because of the lockdown imposed. Things like the you know, gas, electricity, wages paid. If you have to pay leave for staff who were unable to work because of the lockdown, then you're eligible as well. Um, if you had um, loss of perishable goods, so you had goods that you had to just throw out because that, if they've gone off, you, you're also eligible too. So there's a couple of um, examples there in the grant guidelines which will define when you're eligible or not. So it's important to, to understand where you fit into that because there is a declaration that you have to sign off and go, yep, yeah, that, that fits my, my circumstances to be eligible. Um, you have to be currently registered for GST um, as of the 27th of May. So that's an important eligibility, eligibility criteria. Payroll of less than $10 million, which I think most of us here today will be ticking that box off. Hold an ABN as well. Um, and that's probably the main things there. If you're an employee bus employing business, you have to be registered with WorkSafe as well. And you have to be able to prove um, your, your registration with WorkSafe too. Um, the second grant is for more those who are running licensed hospitality venues. So... I guess in our circumstances, the um, the, the Manningham Hotel or or the um, where we've had our, our recent meetings at the Shopping Town Hotel or, or or the like, RSLs or other pubs and clubs. So, if you hold a, a liquor license, and there's a there's a couple of eligibility criteria criteria there, but the amounts have gone up to, from three to, from two and a half to three and a half, and then from five to seven thousand dollars for those lockdown periods. So. Um, I guess that the main the main differences are this is more focused at those businesses who have been really severely impacted. They haven't been on the open at all, haven't been able to do takeaway service. So it's kind of a niche um, grant application and grant funding for the hospitality who have been really severely hit, not just now, but even last year as well. So, um, so that is available. Like I said, there's a couple of... Um, uh, permits that you have to hold to be able to tick the boxes for the eligibility requ um, requirements to apply for this grant. If you do apply for this grant as a licensed hospitality venue, you can't apply for the other one. You can only apply for one or the other. You can't apply for both, so you can't double dip. So if you, this is obviously for a licensed venue, this is the one you go for. You wouldn't go for the general business one. Um, I think that's probably all I said at the back on the grants, 24th of June, that's the date, have to get in. If you do it after that, you won't be eligible. Really important to, to get that in. That's probably the only other thing that I want to mention. And then probably the other thing as well, you have to also supply um, confirmation of your ID as well. So for the business owner, you also have to have either a driver's licence, a Medicare card or a passport and you have to upload a copy of that too to your application just as a proof of identity too. So that's just another practical thing to think about as well when you're applying for the grants. They're probably the, the main points I wanted to raise, Sandy, about the grants. If you have any questions, please let us know. We'll talk to your accountant as well. Fantastic. Um, again, if you go through to your next slide there, Adam, people can take the opportunity to write down your contact details, both for you and um, Daniel. I don't know about anyone else, but I feel like sometimes my head is exploding when I hear all of this. Info. I'm not a numbers lady. So um, I think what you've done today is very logically present so much 
information that is incredibly complex and both you uh, both of you Daniel and Adam clearly know your stuff so we're very grateful to you um, for sharing all that with us today I know I'm grateful for people like you to help people like me who are running a business because um, it certainly is a whole area of expertise that I don't particularly want to develop on my own. So it's great to have people like you too and your organisation around. Um, but key thing I heard in that last part was if you are in Victoria and you want to apply for one of the Circuit Breaker grants, the 24th of June is looming very quickly, Thursday of next week. Uh, so we'll need to prioritise that in our businesses if we want to apply for those grants. Um, now, the recording of this uh, webinar will be made available. If you have any colleagues or um, people you know who would benefit from this information, please let them know to go to our website. It's the Manningham Business Network com.au so the name of our network spelled all as one word manningham business network.com.au and when you go there you can find all recordings of all the other webinars that we've done in this series which provide hugely valuable information to businesses to help us recover from what's probably going on for us gone on for us in the last year and is still partially going on um Daniel and Adam, I want to thank you particularly for your time today and your generosity in everything that you've shared. I'd like to thank everyone online who's watched live with us today. And I particularly want to thank the Victorian State Government on behalf of the Manningham Business Network for enabling us to get this project up and running successfully and enabling our network to provide real support and help to other businesses in the Manningham area. And um, I know there's a lot of hardworking committee and general members of the Manningham Business Network. So thank you to all of you as well. So for now, it's goodbye from me on behalf of the Manningham Business Network and with huge gratitude to the Victorian State Government.